Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful fall evening. Um, Ron and I will do our few little announcements here before we begin. Uh, next, two weeks from tonight is our very last Thursday evening at the museum for this season, and it will be Brenda Kaler, who's going to talk about the, uh, the history of Kaler Drugstore. So I think I've, I've heard a version of this at um, the ladies' Lenten luncheon at St. Paul. Maybe I think maybe, Chloe, you may have been there. And I think she's going to sort of take off on that, but she's going to maybe add a little bit more history. So I, I know it's going to be good, and, and Brenda's a great speaker. Uh, Ron has a couple exciting things to say. <laughs> For once. Yeah. Puts me on the spot. <laughs> right, so, okay. Well, then I'll make you be the van of white for tonight. I can do that. <laughs> Some of you may have attended the Overland Inn dinner this, this weekend, and you noticed I wasn't there. That's because I was down in Columbus at the Ohio Local History Alliance receiving an outstanding uh, history outreach award for the Arts Department store exhibit upstairs. There were only four exhibits in the entire state that received this award this year. And we were one of the four. And I have to thank Sarah Fisher. You know, if it wasn't for Sarah helping out, you know, this would have never uh, been finished. Well, and, and Ron too. I mean, it was really, I think Ron got the ball rolling for, for this exhibit. So, And, and this is this the Arts Department store exhibit uh, has a special place in my heart. My mother worked there for years. In fact, when she was out at um, Wyandotte Manor, and you know, she had Alzheimer's and did, didn't know who she was. But every once in a while, you know, she'd be fooling around in her room and, Mommy, what are you doing? Well, she was at Arts Department store. What did it look like? So <laughs> anyway, I, I thought that was sort of wonderful that she remembered she worked there. You know, she brought back that word. Yeah, so that was what was really nice and what they liked about this. So that in addition to it being, you know, an immersive exhibit, it also brought back a lot of memories and a lot of stories from the community. So it was, right. really became an interactive exhibit once we opened up. So congratulations, Ron. Thank you. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's upstairs. You can go up later tonight and see it. Um, a couple other things coming up this month in October. As Bonnie said, we have the last Thursday evening program. On October 22nd, we have our uh, Food, Fun, and Frights, our family-friendly Halloween program here at the museum. Sarah's already been sending me ideas, and she's like, I want you to make this and this and this. So and we'll be getting ready for that. And then October 29th, we'll have our annual Oak Hill Cemetery Walk, so a chance to take it, a nice stroll through the cemetery, look at some of the headstones, learn some of their meanings, uh, hear about some of the interesting people interred there. Hopefully, unlike the past years, it won't be raining or snowing. <laughs> and, or like the first year when I lost my voice and Bonnie had to step up. And, I translated. <laughs> so, uh, we will have, uh, uh, it's not technically a Thursday evening, but November 10th, as part of our uh, Veterans Day program, uh, I will be doing a program here that evening on November 10th about the Wyandotte County soldiers that gave their lives or lost their lives during the war, uh, kind of honoring the men from the Mexican-American War all the way up through Vietnam. So it'll be a, a nice kind of tie-in to our annual exhibit. Um, so Woody would not let me get away if I didn't mention the annual gun raffle. We have tickets here tonight if you haven't re received any. Uh, it's coming up quick. Uh, we only had 400 tickets printed. and They're selling out fast, so you get them tonight before they disappear. But the winner gets her choice of a Kimber handgun or a $1,000 gift card to ANA. And then the other person drawn will get the, the item that wasn't chosen at first. So those are here. So we've Think got of that as a donation. It's only 20 bucks. Think of it as a donation to the museum and an opportunity to win a prize. So it's a great <laughs> opportunity. I'm excited. We have tickets to sell. So see me before you leave to get your tickets. And for those of you who may not have been to the museum before or haven't been here in a while, 
I want to invite you, like after the program, if you want to go upstairs to our military room, the early military, and see some of our World War I artifacts that kind of tie in along with this. So I'm going to give it back to Bonnie. She may know the presenter a little better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say one thing about this presentation, which is good, is Tom can do his own PowerPoint. Uh, which is really a big deal because when I do my programs, he, I ask him to do my PowerPoint, which he always does, and I really appreciate it. So I'm going to give this over, the microphone over to Tom. I was going to say thank you, Ron. Thank you, dear. <laughs> you, you may call Ron dear. Too. <laughs> uh, so I'm up here tonight uh, because... Uh, first and foremost, I'm a member of the local organization, the uh, Veterans Heritage Foundation of Wyandotte County. Uh, a couple of my board member colleagues are here. Steve Tanner, stand up Steve, from uh, McCutcheonville, and uh, Dave Fadley. He, I don't know what he's going to admit to, but I'm going to say Sycamore. Uh, uh, welcome. Um, they were, they've been instrumental in this. And uh, for the record, um, tonight is a bit of a culmination. Uh, we have been at this for 10 years to get this uh, monument uh, uh, designed and placed and soon, soon enough dedicated. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, um, I want to say ordeal, but experience uh, <laughs> that uh, has gotten us this far. And uh, a little bit then at the end about uh, some of the uh, historical precedents uh, behind what you see. Uh, so this is indeed a picture uh, of the front of this monument, now sitting right out here, short distance away, uh, at Bicentennial Park. Uh, that's about six tons of uh, uh, polished black granite. Um, the image... Uh, is what is known as the American Doughboy. Uh, that is uh, a story in itself. Uh, uh, so from about a hundred years ago, uh, this image in this country was wildly popular. Uh, the war was over, uh, the good guys had won. Uh, a, a sculptor uh, in southern Indiana uh, the town of Spencer, Indiana. E. M. Vicaney was his name. And I don't know the origins of that name, but it sounds uh, Eastern European uh, to me. But he'd, he'd been born in Spencer, and his father had been a uh, uh, stonemason, had taught him the trade, but he was more talented than his father. Uh, and he actually designed this image in about 1920. Uh, it was uh, as popular as uh, at that time as other fads since, uh, like uh, hula hoops and pet rocks and uh, any other such thing that you can think of, but very, very popular. Um, and I'll talk more uh, about all of this. This is the back of the monument that faces North Sandusky Avenue, quotation from General John Pershing of World War I fame. No commander has ever, was ever privileged to lead a finer force. No commander ever derived greater inspiration from the performance of his troops. Uh, you know, we're quite familiar with uh, military wartime commanders from, of course, uh, the World War II era uh, and more recent uh, uh, skirmishes and wars, uh, but this, while this does seem like uh, ancient history, you know, more than a hundred years ago, uh, nevertheless, it has the same resonance, it rings the same bells uh, um, today, if you think about it, and know a little bit more about uh, the World War I uh, era. Um, uh, so uh, it's important, and I'll be talking about this later, but the point is, uh, here we are, tonight, finally, recognizing our Wyandotte County uh, World War I 
better. Um, so we had to start somewhere, you know. I'll just say there's there's no catalog where you can look up uh, World War I monuments and uh, pick it out and order it and it comes on a truck and you put it up and you're done. Uh, you've got to figure it out. Uh, um, so this is a picture of an American doughboy monument in Fountain Cemetery uh, in Astoria. It's in beautiful condition. You can go visit and see it, walk up close to it. Uh, uh, but we were going to come up with something that included this. Uh, this is the plaque on the base uh, of that monument. I'll read it to you. Lest we forget, dedicated to the sacred memory of all the sons of Fostoria and vicinity who served in the World War. Not World War I, not the Great War, the, the World War. Uh, and to those who made the supreme sacrifice for liberty, liberty and humanity. Uh, 1927. This went up in 1927. Later I'll tell you how they happen to be one of the towns that happens to have received this monument. Uh, so that picture, using a digital photo editor, got transformed you know, by me uh, into an etched image. And uh, following that, uh, we were first considering having a carved, carved out of light gray granite base relief image. We were working with one of the... Uh, uh, gravestone suppliers. Uh, There's a company in Columbus called Techstone. Uh, we had bought the granite from them. We asked them if this could be done. They said yes. They had stone carvers who could carve this. So the carvers needed to uh, create drawings for our review and approval or recommendations for changes. Uh, so we started to receive drawings from them. Uh, I'll just tell you what the secret is here. The carvers were Chinese. <laughs> in China. Oh, in China. I mean, they got the detail all right. But I'll just say that uh, that face does not look like that face. Not even close. Uh, I don't know why they uh, couldn't just uh, copy it. Uh, but uh, uh, at the final discussion where we decided, well, we're going to have to go in a different direction, this isn't working, I remember uh, in a very frustrated voice saying, if we have that monument made up to, uh, that looks like that, I can't live in this town anymore. <laughs> <laughs> then our director, who's not here this evening, William Savage, uh, had met a sculptor uh, um, in Arkansas. He's got, he was visiting down there and he uh, um, met this individual who does uh, quite a lot of military themed uh, sculpting and is actually uh, noted for a couple of different images that he has created that you may have seen. Uh, so it seemed natural to us to transfer that etched image onto a bronze plate full-size bronze plate on front of that black polished uh, tap, uh, granite tablet that I mentioned. Um, the starting price is $85,000. <laughs> so no, we're not going to do that. Uh, back to the drawing board. What's next? Uh, it was uh, then that somebody, uh, and I don't remember exactly who, it might have been Brad Batten, another He's a funeral director also on the board. Uh, said, well, we could have it laser etched. Uh, now, we've all seen uh, uh, gravestones with nice etchings on them. You know, tractors and faces and various images. Uh, maybe a, a, a foot 
pi and a foot wide. As it turns out, you can have uh, anything uh, of any size in digital format, full size or larger, etched onto polished granite. There's a company, Labor, uh, Lebanon Laser Imaging, close to Cincinnati. Uh, they have done massive things that I've seen, 10 foot by 20 foot, uh, like murals etched uh, onto this stone. Uh, so there's, that's what we started, uh, started with next. And uh, uh, we then took that uh, uh, to the um, logical extreme. So, this, remember I mentioned the company in uh, Columbus that we had bought the stone from. They did the uh, carving on the back of the monument and on the uh, base uh, of the monument. So this is inside their plant uh, at Techstone. See, there's the corner of the base over there. Here's the tablet from an overhead view. Uh, there you can see this corner uh, right here and the tablet over here. Same thing from the, the other side, so to speak. Uh, so, uh, and there's the tablet. So. The tablet had uh, already been shipped down to Lebanon, and the Lebanon people, uh, at uh, our recommendation, uh, located another monument, uh, American Doughboy Monument, in a uh, cemetery uh, in or near Cincinnati, Blue Ash. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Took a picture, and they etched that picture uh, onto the stone. Uh, and shipped it back to Techstone, and then this work got done. Uh, and then once that was done, uh, Tom Berg, Berg Vault, uh, around here, uh, um, drove down to Techstone, which he's probably only done four or five hundred times, uh, and picked this, uh, picked all this material up. So a base, a sub base, a tablet, a whole lot of uh, 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 polished granite. Uh, now, here's the moment where, uh, uh, well, I'll just say there were a lot of discussions about how, how can we be sure that nobody's going to drop this thing. <laughs> uh, so let me push a button. Whoops. Nope. Well, it's a boat. It's a video. <laughs> uh, that thing is up in the air, swinging around a little bit. Let's see if. Oh well, maybe I can't do this. I don't know why. Worked earlier. Worked earlier. Yeah. Uh, in any event, it, it took a couple of minutes, but uh, these are uh, heavy-duty nylon straps. The gentleman. Uh, here's the gentleman I mentioned, Stacy, Stacy Plaster. There's Brad Batten. And there's Steve. There's Steve. Think about Steve. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and the point being, you kind of get one chance uh, to do this because once it's sitting down, uh, Stacy especially, and then Brad, they don't want to pick it up again. <laughs> if, you're, if we're close enough, then it's perfect. Uh, so you try to get uh, perfect or at least close enough. Uh, and uh, let's see. So then.
Here we go. Because this is a good bit. I think this is a good video. Here we go. Well, I'm watching it move there, but not here. I don't know why that is. Let's move on. Notice he's not asking for my help. I, I was going to say, he didn't see it in the first place. I didn't want to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I can ask for Randy's help. Do you have the ideas? Yeah. So it's playing on your screen, but not that yeah. screen? Yeah. Is it extended yeah. displays? Yeah. You could just or track it. Huh? Duplicate. Well, they're mirrored. It's, yeah. it's duplicate the, the yeah. screen on like both. Like three year old yeah. make it for me to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is bizarre. If they're can you just reduce the PowerPoint down play with the I, play yeah, I've got a different I've got another way to do this. Just bear with me. Well, while he's doing that, I'll tell you a, a little story. Uh, some of you may know the connection between this house and World War One. Some of you may not. But Dr. Robert McConnell, who lived here with Leafy Beery, they had two sons. Both their sons, Robert uh, and Fowler, both went to the University of Chicago. And while they were there at the university, they, along with about 38 of their classmates and a couple of professors, joined the Illinois National Guard in 1916. And they were sent down to uh, the Mexican border during the Pancho Villa raids. Afterwards, he went back to Chicago and started working for Sears. In 1918, he and his brother served as machine gun captains in World War I. He was actually given a leave of absence from Sears and Roebuck to go serve in the Army and then came back to his position afterwards. Thank you, Ron. Okay. I'm here. Thank you, dear. <laughs> um, so, uh, finally got a design, finally got it placed. Uh, if you take a look now, there are sidewalks, flagpole with a flag, flag there's lighting, uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, here at Upper Sandusky, we now have a flower fund. I was going to suggest that we, our organization, would pay money to have flowers occasionally placed out there. Uh, there are four sizable monuments out there, this being one. Uh, they put flowers on either end of these monuments year-round. Mm -hmm. So we're about to make a donation to the flower fund. But in any event, this is why we do this. Uh, now, the, the person that gets credit, literally, for, for this is uh, Ron Martin, who's doing research uh, on veterans from all wars from Wyandotte County. Um, you may think that, well, you know, you want to do a list of World War veterans from Wyandotte County, you, you just call the military and they'll give you a list. No. Uh, they don't have this. There's no database. There's no regular source. You only come up with this if you do the research. And which, he's which he's done, and which isn't complete. It's underway. Uh, uh, he found these gentlemen's pictures on, did you say find a grave? Find a grave. Find a grave, a website that you can look at. Um, uh, so here is uh, J Private James Bear, uh, Hugh Raymond Ely, 1918, and Stanley I. Ogan, a private. Uh, uh, 
uh, from, the, uh, of course, the same period. Here is half of the uh, list of Wynak County World War I deceased. I'll show you the second half in a moment, but uh, you'll, you can see the uh, little indicators be behind the names. The asterisk means killed in action. Uh, the uh, no letter at all, no indicator at all, means uh, died from disease. Um, William Clutie, you see his name is in bold. I'll come back to this. Uh, what is the pound sign? The hashes? That I believe is died of the wounds. Died of wounds. That there's Homer F. Salmon, first to die of disease during the war. I look at the date, 1918. Well, we only joined in 1917, so it was barely a year later, and he'd all, uh, already passed away. Um, and then back here is William uh, Clutie from Cary. He died on November 25th, 1919. Uh, a year after the war ended, officially ended. Uh, so, uh, made the ultimate sacrifice, made the ultimate sacrifice, um, and uh, it was it was the same, but it was different. Didn't have the kind of medical services then that they have today. The, the question would be, well, if if the medical services, as they are known today, had been uh, available then, 100 years ago, how many might have survived? We don't know. Uh, I would have guessed, I would be guessing many, however. Um, so, this is all thanks to Ron. Thank you, Ron. Good thing Ron's here. <laughs> uh, now, the doughboy, the American doughboy, that image. This is the creator, uh, E. M. Um sculptor, mentioned from Spencer, Indiana. Um, here are some uh, facts about him. Um, 1876, 1946, married in 1904. Uh, he, he grew up in uh, Spencer, Indiana, but uh, in his first job, he was 29 years old, he ends up in Americus, Georgia. Uh, working as a designer and carver for the C.J. Clark uh, Monuments Company. And then in 09, he's moving along uh, to Georgia Granite and Marble Company in Rome, Georgia. And then in 13, he proposed this giant peace memorial to be built in a town called Fitzgerald, Georgia. Never built, probably due to the, the uh, estimated cost, $150,000 at a time. Uh, and then in 1920, he designed the Spirit of the American Doughboy. Never sculpted it. He didn't do it. I mean, the design was uh, well received. Uh, at, they built one of these uh, at the uh, C.J. Clark Company and, and erected it in, uh, at the uh, City Hall in Americus, Georgia, but they couldn't pay for it. The city couldn't pay for it, so it was covered in tarpaulins, veils as they called them. Uh, and, uh, but they did pay for it uh, two years later, so then it was unveiled uh, in Americus, Georgia. Well, by that time, the image had become wildly popular. Uh, his company, um, that he founded in 1922, back in Spencer, he moved back to Spencer with Cora, uh, was called the Impoluck, Impoluck Company. <laughs> uh, produced hundreds uh, of these uh, uh, America, Spirit of America uh, doughboys. It's, um, it's not sculpted out of stone. It's made of pressed bronze sheets. You know, press out the bronze in the right shape and then assemble the thing. Lots and lots of towns uh, ended up with one of these uh, doughboy images. 
uh, there is a there are some interested people today who are doing research on this. They have a database. You can look at it online. Uh, 140 of these doughboys are, as they say, extant. They exist today. Nobody knows ultimately how many uh, were actually created and delivered to various towns. But you see, remember the doughboys carrying a, a, a rifle, or he's, he's, he's got a grenade up here with his hand, an arm extended like this, and then he's carrying a rifle over here. It's all made out of bronze. It, that design doesn't stand up to the elements of weather uh, very well. Uh, I would like to know how many uh, Spirit of American Doughboys there are lying in pieces behind a municipal building in how many different towns. Uh, it only takes one uh, child to decide to swing on the rifle and then uh, the rifle uh, is a problem. It has to be replaced. Uh, the people at the Fountain Cemetery, for example, in Pastoria are paying a great deal of attention to main be sure that that statue is properly maintained uh, and can survive through the uh, vicissitudes uh, of weather and uh, playing around children and you know all that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but in any event, uh, Mr. Bikini, uh, 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 his wife died in 33, got married again. Uh, she died, the second wife died in 1846, and he committed suicide uh, uh, two months later in 1946. Uh, so uh, he would have been 70 years old uh, at the time. Uh, it's kind of a sad story. Uh, but um, uh, he was a, a, a brilliant designer and a, a very good sculptor, but not a good businessman. He just didn't quite pull it together. He, he'd done other things that were successful. Uh, the Impoluck company, that, uh, he, uh, of which he was the founder, had a little leprechaun uh, figure that became wildly popular. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, uh, the local post office in Spencer recorded uh, in the first year 100,000 Impoluck items passing through its offices as they were shipped to and fro around the country. So it was a, a kind of success, but uh, not a great deal of financial success uh, for Mr. Bikini. Um, and finally, uh, uh, the, the American Doughboy name, um, as they say, the origins are not well known. Uh, they're only surmising. Uh, it seems that the first mention of Doughboys in relationship to uh, um, army people, army men, uh, was in the um, Mexican-American War between 1848, 1846 and 1848. Uh, so uh, uh, they, they don't know why they were called doughboys, except that uh, one theory was that, well, soldiers marching around in the dusty plains of northern Mexico would come back covered in a light-colored dust and somehow that reminded somebody of dough, and therefore they became known as uh, dough boys. Uh, don't know. Don't know if that's a true story or not. It's speculation. Uh, but there were uh, sailors uh, under the command of uh, Lord Nelson, Horatio Nelson. His sailors were called dough boys. Uh, Herman Melville wrote the book uh, uh, Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. There was a cabin boy described as timorous. Timorous, you know, fearful, uh, 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 that sort of thing. He named the cabin boy Doughboy. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't explain why uh, uh, he, he gave that name, but the word was popular. Um, uh, what is well known uh, is that uh, in the middle 1800s, a popular uh, uh, food, uh, I hesitate to call it a treat, 
uh, was baked in campfires uh, and uh, uh, was made with fried, uh, well, they were fried flour dumplings. Those were called doughboys. There's probably a connection there, but I can't draw it together uh, in some meaningful, easily explainable way. It's just that that word, doughboy, the phrase is, is kind of unusual. And then, of course, somewhere in the uh, early part of the uh, 20th century, uh, Pillsbury came along with their doughboy and kind of took ownership uh, of that uh, word altogether. And still, uh, owns that. In fact, if you start trying to do research and look, try to look up Doughboy on the internet, you're going to be looking at a lot of pictures of the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> uh, so, um, in any event, uh, the statue uh, by itself uh, is considered to be a truly uh, uh, unique and iconic uh, image that summarizes, in a way, the uh, uh, American experience during uh, World War I. That remains the case uh, even today. When you see uh, that uh, doughboy, uh, it was uh, uh, everything about the image was carefully considered. He's, he's wearing the, a certain kind of helmet that was unique to World War I. He's got a gas mask, uh, a, a, a certain kind of belt. The rifle is a certain kind of rifle. The leggings uh, by themselves, uh, because there are wraps around the lower leg, uh, are kind of unique uh, to World War I, American soldiers of World War I. Uh, so that's still the case today. There's nobody uh, challenging uh, any of that. Um, and we felt that, therefore, it seemed uh, highly appropriate that we would use that image, which isn't copyrighted. Uh, you know, I suppose you'd have a problem if you tried to try to set up a factory and manufacture these things uh, in en masse. Uh, but uh, it seemed appropriate, and still seems appropriate, to use that image uh, um, on a monument in honor of our uh, local individuals who made the, uh, in, in particular, made the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, during World War One. By the way, one of the names on the list, I didn't point it out when we were looking at those names, was uh, William Noss, the namesake of the um, Legion Post uh, here in Upper Sandusky. Uh, so, uh, uh, there you have the story. I anticipate, uh, tentatively anticipate, that we'll have a dedication ceremony for this monument on um, Veterans Day next month, November 11th. Uh, that's when we, our organization, turns ownership of the monument over to uh, Upper Sandusky. Any questions? On the original picture, what's Eddie's feet? S uh, stumps. Stunt, because he's walking across the battlefield. Okay, I didn't know so, if he had stepped on a rail fence. Right, uh, I know. They were unexploded no, shells. Just, just stumps, stumps and barbed wire. Okay. Barbed right. wire. Right. Uh, uh, you can find images, uh, photographed images of World War I battlefields, and that's what you're looking at. Okay, all right. Cool. Yeah. Maybe this is a redundant question. You mentioned the weight. What holds this together? Yeah. I mean, you know, kids can't push it over. But you no. said it. It's not going to move. There's no, no. no pins. Or uh, the the uh, first of all, the base is uh, buried four feet, so we're below the frost line. Uh, uh, the concern normally you go down to the frost line, uh, but it's so heavy uh, that it was determined that having the base lower uh, and therefore larger uh, was appropriate for this much weight. Uh, we were discussing early on that question at some great length. Mr. Pl uh, Plaster assured us uh, it would take more than a superhuman effort to push that over. So they're not connected at all? They're just, just by the weight? Correct. One sitting on top of the other. 
sealed so that water doesn't get in under there. If you get water under there, then you've got a problem. Well, usually, I help help set some of this room back that day. So we put like a caulking. Yeah, between the base and the top, right. that sealed it. Right. That's what we got. How much did it cost? You mentioned it was one of the costs. Uh, right now, we're uh, um, around $25,000. Now, if you ask me, how, well, how much did that other monument cost? Not even close to this. What's different this time uh, is that, um, well, when you're shipping three and a half tons of uh, granite all over the place on the uh, back of a tractor trailer, that's kind of costly. Uh, remember, it had to go from uh, uh, Columbus down to Lebanon, Ohio, and back. So that added some money to it. Uh, the sidewalks, all the, the flat work, used to be done for us gratis. And then our, our main man died. Darn him. Uh, uh, so we're writing another check uh, for, for all of that flat work and all of that excavation, uh, all that sort of thing. Now, I want you to know, uh, none of this is done with uh, you know, tax revenue, government funds, anything like that. It's purely uh, paid for with bought and paid for with private donations and uh, gun raffle money. Mm -hmm. We run the 52-week gun raffle, which we've, uh, it's uh, uh, a thousand tickets sold at $30 a ticket. Half the money, uh, the, the 30, half of the 30 goes toward purchasing the prizes and we keep the other half. We've sold it out 12 times in a row. So mm -hmm. we, can, we can afford to do these uh, sorts of things, thankfully, thankfully. Uh, but um, uh, it's not getting cheaper. I wish I could tell you, hey, by the way, uh, we're going to do the next one for half this cost. Doesn't look like it. Does not look like it. Anything else? Where is the monument in town again? I'm not sure okay. I understand. So uh, you're I on... You're on South 7th Street yes. out here right yes. now. So if you go back here, this way to Wyandotte, okay. turn right, go one block to Sandusky, okay. that's the center of town, okay. turn left, go, uh, that's to the north. Okay. You go north, uh, just on the edge of town is Bicentennial Park on your left. Oh, okay. This monument, the back of it, okay. faces North Sandusky <laughs> Avenue. If you get to the hospital, you went too far. Right. <laughs> right. If you get to the hospital or the high school, you went too far. <laughs> that is. Oh, okay. It's right before that. Right on the yeah. main road. Yeah. On the left side. Yeah. Because you're going out of town. Yeah. yeah. If you drive that way now, now it, it, you don't, that'll be the opposite of the way you need to go home. Okay. Uh, but not far. Okay. It's lit up. Okay. So you can see it. It's okay. beautiful. Right. Tom. Was it through one of those doughboys down? It seems to me it was one down in Marion, one of the yes. cemeteries that was vandalized quite a while back. I don't know what down there. You know that story, Mike? No, I don't. I don't uh, okay. know, but I know it was vandalized. Well, they now have a, a veterans park uh, across the road or the street from the Hardy Memorial. Uh, with some very nice monuments in it. Uh, included in there is a doughboy. It looks to me like a uh, rebuilt doughboy that doesn't quite look like the, the image, in my opinion. But it's a doughboy nevertheless. I think the original one was vandalized prior to yeah. That, yeah. that park you're See, there's about. a foundry in, De in Detroit that will build you one or repair the one that you have, but at rather enormous expense. Because it's, you know, done by uh, very, very skilled craftsmen and artists, and they're not cheap. D. Tom, you might touch on some of the other uh, 
projects that we do with uh, our gun raffle money and donations, cemetery work, uh, right. wheelchair work. Right. Um, so who is we? Who is the we? Veterans Heritage Foundation okay. of Wyandotte County. Nine, nine board members okay. and uh, anybody that we can hire. Uh, so there are other monuments in this park. There's a World War II monument, a Korean War uh, monument, a Vietnam War monument. Uh, all unique, all individually designed, uh, some with veterans' names on them. Uh, we've gotten past that. Uh, I personally, nobody's asked me this, so I'll just tell you, I think that someday we'll put a plaque near uh, this World War I monument with those names on it, but not until Ron uh, gives us the okay. <laughs> that, uh, the, the experience, I'll just tell you, when you put the names on the monument, you never finish putting the names on the monument. Remember how difficult I mentioned it is to get uh, anything out of the federal government? Uh, it's uh, that difficult or more so to get all the names and get the right ones and get them on the monument. So uh, somebody in this room gets to be quite involved with uh, getting that work done. Our first monument uh, we placed in there was in the year 2005. 2005 was the Vietnam Memorial. And last year we put names on that same monument. Yeah. Yes, we did. So it's a never-ending thing. Never-ending. Yeah. You know, I, we told people again and again and again uh, in 2005, we, we want to put the names on the monument. Uh, not everybody wanted their name on the monument because they thought the monument wasn't going to be nice or there was going to be some kind of a problem or something wasn't going to work out. And then they saw the monument and they liked it with then the, 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 the agreed names on it. Then they wanted their name on the monument. So you can do that, but it's a whole different kind of challenge uh, than getting it done when you're designing and fabricating the monument. Yeah. Did you say Homer Samet was the first person in, from Wyandotte County to die in the war? In, in World War I? I. Yeah. Well, I, Rob, is Robbie here? Is it, aren't you related to Homer Samet? Yeah. That Homer Samet was my mother's first cousin. Now, he actually died two years before my mom was born. But um, Harold Samet, as some of you may know, um, was also Homer Samet's first cousin. And he named his only son Homer F. Samet uh -huh. in honor. And the cannon at the Chandler Cemetery in just outside uh, Marseilles is in honor of uh, yes. Homer F. Samet. Yes. And he died, as you so accurately mentioned, of disease. <clears throat> he was in New Jersey, and um, his father, Christian Samet, my grandfather, Frederick Samet, his brother, went out to see him, and this is an awful story that my mom told, that um, that Homer Samet begged his dad to take him home, and he could not. He died of influenza in 1918. Oh, yeah, um, it's kind of <clears throat> Yeah. If you ever go to Washington, D.C., the Korean Oh, yeah, the battlefield, the yeah. actual statue. Oh, yeah, it's you haunting. Walk, you walk through there at night sometimes, <laughs> and it's something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, it's a uh, technically it's a monument, yes, but it's like uh, 25 like monuments. The, it's like you're walking through the battlefield, yes, right? indeed. That's true. Yes, they are working on a project now to create a wall similar to the Vietnam Wall with the names of the Korean War soldiers. But it's been a long project, and again, trying to identify all of them, oh, yeah. who lost their life, and, and verify that. But that's one of the newest projects that the, the, the Veterans Foundation down the, the mall is right. working on. Right. Tell them how 
the, the sculptor's wife died. I, I did that. Remember I told you? I think well, you need to tell us. Well, anyway, <laughs> anyway he, when he was doing this research, I, I was very disturbed that, to find out that this um, sculptor's wife had died by suicide, so I, I looked her up anyway. Of course, this was the day there were no antibiotics. She had diphtheria so bad. And anyway, her throat grew together, and she couldn't, she couldn't breathe anymore, and she died. And then, of course, he committed suicide a couple months later. But... I don't know. I've, I've sort of had dreams about that poor woman. What an awful oh. death. Mm. Unthinkable. Uh, mm. Um, on a tad bit lighter note, do you think that any of the wildly popular Impala leprechauns made their way to South Bend? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that they did. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. And in fact, uh, lots of these things. Uh, uh, you can find uh, available on eBay. Now, not a full-scale Spirit of the American Doughboy statue, but little statues that were also manufactured in the uh, plant, the Impala plant, are, are available from anywhere from several hundred dollars up to a couple of thousand dollars uh, for these things. Some of them in poor repair for only five hundred dollars, uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, I think I saw Impaluk products uh, also available uh, as well. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you for coming.